Welcome to Soccer 101, the podcast where we delve deep into the soccer questions and topics you never knew you had. Today, we're talking about playoffs. You might think they were a quirk of US soccer, but in fact, they're used all around the world and their history dates back further than you might think. My name is Ryan Bailey and joining me in this four-man bracket, we have Taylor Rockwell. Hello, I'm excited to talk about this one. A a topic that has a lot of history and simultaneously not a lot of history. Let's get into it. Oh, it's a paradoxical topic. Mm -hmm. I love it. Joe Lowry, do you love it? Oh, I love it, Ryan Bailey. Graham Rutherford, do you love it as much as one is possible (laughs) to love a thing as a Scott? Oh, if that if that segment isn't clipped up as a soundbite from Joe, then I'll be disappointed. <laughs> uh, that, that was glorious. <laughs> hello, Ryan. <laughs> hello, hello, gents. Um, why don't we get straight to it and discuss playoffs? I why love we... it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get a clean one, Taylor. We'll have to go again look right, for that no later. <laughs> All right, gents, why don't we get straight to it and discuss playoffs? Maybe a little definition, maybe a little bit about their history. Taylor Rockwell, would you like to get the playoff ball rolling? I would. And I would like to start with that definition for a moment, because I think a thing that is going to be very pedantic, I apologize in advance, is the distinction between a playoff and a tournament. Do we want to create a sort of difference there or are we okay with talking about them as sort of interchangeable? Because to me, playoffs tend to be postseason. You have had a regular season and now you're having the kind of aftermath of that in a knockout round format versus a tournament is sort of set up to be an elimination competition. Mm. And so I'm not sure if those distinctions need to be drawn for the purposes of this conversation or if we're okay with sort of having it be whatever we need it to be. Well, there is some differentiation there, as you're right, Taylor. Say, like, the Champions League is technically playoff format because it's a knockout bracket after a group stage. But I think for the purposes of this conversation, we're talking about sort of a one- or two-leg knockout game which typically comes after a league format, Mm -hmm. Um, something which we're familiar with in MLS or the like. So maybe is... I don't know what the the defining line is. is. And also there's another issue here, Taylor, because there are playoffs that win championships and win titles and those that serve other purposes like for promotion for relegation and for determining um, spots in other leagues as well so i think then it's basically when after other games have occurred teams two or more are basically drawn into an elimination style tournament with an ultimate victor i don't think we ever get like ultimate victors (laughs) a short of like Concacaf olympic qualifying which is its own weird entity i think for the most part yeah we can just categorize it as Like teams that have uh, had prior games now moving into an elimination format. And for me, there are lots of different instances of that in different sports throughout the years. In terms of the postseason aspect of things, I think as far as I could tell, that originates in American football in the early 1930s. And basically, as is the case, I think, with a lot of sport, it just comes down to two teams were tied and we had to figure out a way to decide who won. So they played off against each other and we ended up having a winner. Um, it used to be when, when the NFL was first created in 1920, uh, much to the horror of Ted Lasso, I'm sure it was as we understand the Premier League to be. For example, you have the regular season standings at the end of the year and whoever's on top wins the title. But when you have two teams with an identical record, You don't really want to go to point scored or something like that. And who knows if that was even a thing being tracked in 1920. So they did first versus second with the uh, equal records and the winner was crowned. And from there, that became sort of the standard in the NFL and I think became the standard for a lot of other sports. It may be uh, predated in baseball or, or rugby or elsewhere, but that was kind of a big institutionalized one that I think popularized the idea of a postseason elimination tournament. For soccer, as I could understand it, and emphasizing soccer, it seemed to be the first season of the NASL in 1968. That was, they had playoffs right from the very beginning. That was part and parcel of what the DNA of the league was going to be, and it was until the league folded. Major League Soccer brings them about in 1996, and and I think American sports are always going to have, or regularly are going to have, that sort of playoff format because it's just what americans i think are used to it's what we grow up with and it's kind of an expectation that you will have that at the end of the season for a lot of people i think first getting into soccer it's weird that you have the regular season and then you have your your champion there's no playoffs there's no extra tournament it just is what it is 
Well, Taylor, yeah, that's that's an excellent explanation, um, and that certainly serves the purpose of uh, playoffs for a championship. But uh, like uh, Kid Rock and line dancing, um, it's not just something that came from the US uh, because they have uh, uh, there have been instances of playoffs. Uh, Further back in history, Graham, I was looking through the annals of history and found that not long after the English uh, game, the English game was codified in the late 19th century, 1892, when they're expanding from one to two top divisions, they used test matches to decide uh, relegation and promotion between them and to decide which leagues um, certain teams should be in. And those test matches were kind of playoffs, Graham, but I think if we're going to look at the first true playoffs, we look a little further ahead to the mid-50s. Are you talking about the the World Cup around that time, Ryan? I might be. Go on, Graham. Yeah, so um, the 1950 World Cup, it was in the rules that teams that finished on level points in the group stages would, would have a playoff. It didn't actually happen in that tournament, but in 1954, we had two playoffs to, uh, as I say, separate teams that finished on the same points in the groups. You had a playoff between West Germany and Turkey, which West Germany won, and then you also had one between Switzerland and Italy, which Switzerland won. So in international football, it, it, it does go back longer than I suspected it would. I, I don't remember the 1954 <laughs> World Cup very well. No? Um, so I was surprised to learn that playoffs went back that far, but obviously it's slightly different in that that was used as a breaker rather than to hand out uh, you know, a, a championship. Yeah. I guess that decided a place in the next round of the tournament, but still slightly different to maybe what we see now. But just generally speaking, when you're talking about the test matches there that they had in the late 1800s in, in English soccer, there is more of a footprint of playoffs in English soccer and European soccer than you would maybe expect. They're often play- painted as an Americanism of sport. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the English Football League introduced playoffs in, in 1987. And as you say, there was a history of them maybe experimenting a little bit with playoff style format b- before then. And, you know, when you look at it and think back to what soccer might have been, what was like at that time, it was, it was quite a bold move. And I can imagine it was probably not very popular with a lot of fans at the moment. And almost certainly Americans were blamed aimed for something for ruining American soccer <laughs> sorry English soccer as tends to be the case Americans always get blamed but uh, actually as you hint there, there there's a, a history of, of playoffs in soccer that go back a long way there is indeed and they are used all over Europe and indeed the rest of the world I'd like to dig into that but Joe before we do can we just uh, get a little explainer on MLS playoffs uh, why MLS <laughs> has them and uh, a little bit about the format and how maybe teams can go through without scoring any goals or having any shots Oh my goodness. So it's fitting that we're recording this show. We'd scheduled it before Real Salt Lake in the year 2021 beat the Seattle Sounders after taking (laughs) zero, I repeat, zero shots in 120 minutes of soccer, 90 minutes of regulation, 30 minutes of extra time, plus stoppage time, and then they didn't actually shoot the ball towards the goal or at all until the penalty shootout. And they ended up winning uh, six to five on penalties against the Sounders. Just an insane game. MLS in general structures their playoffs right now in the year 2021, where the top seven teams from each conference, so from the East and from the West, make the playoffs. The top seed gets a bye in each conference. Round one then is between teams two through seven in each conference. Then you've got conference semis where the one seeds get added in and then the conference finals and then MLS Cup. 51.9% 51.9% of teams get into the MLS postseason, which I don't particularly appreciate or enjoy while I do enjoy the aspect of playoffs. Since 2012, MLS has used that system where the top X number of teams from each conference make it to the postseason. It hasn't always been that way, though. In the past, MLS has done division winners. They've done top eight teams regardless of conference. They've done top two teams per conference with the next best four teams getting in after that. So they've played around with the format a lot. I would be surprised if they deviate from the top X number of teams from each conference as the league continues to expand. But uh, MLS MLS is a welcoming group when it comes to making it into the postseason. <laughs> Yeah, it's not 51.9%, did you say, Joe? That's not yep. terribly challenging, is it? And uh, Not a single Los Angelian team in uh, in the year of our Lord 2021. Who'd have thunk it? Um, why don't we uh, take a little look at uh, promotion, uh, sorry, excuse me, playoffs and how they work elsewhere in the world right after this short break. Today's episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN is like using your smartphone without a protective case. Most of the time, you'll probably be fine, but all it takes is one accidental drop onto solid concrete to make you wish you had protected yourself. I've done that 
so many times with so many phones, I do immediately wish that I had gone for the indestructible case, or in this case, indestructible ExpressVPN. Because every time you connect to an unencrypted network in cafes, hotels, airports, whatever they might be, your online data is not secured. And any hacker, a 12-year-old hacker, let's say, on the same network could gain access and steal your personal data, passwords, financial details, you name it. But that is why you get ExpressVPN, because it creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the Internet that hackers cannot get into. They cannot breach. They cannot steal your sensitive data. Or I guess they could, but it would take over a billion years with a supercomputer to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. So you can fire up the app. Click one button to get protected, and away you go. It works on all devices, phones, laptops, tablets, and more. And a key thing about ExpressVPN that we have talked about before, but we experience whenever we use it, is that you don't have that massive drop-off that you might get with other VPN services where the speed will throttle, and then you're not able to get access to what you would like to, or it gets all pixelated and blurry. Nobody needs that. ExpressVPN keeps it going, keeps it quick, but keeps you securely connected. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash soccer. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S V-P-N dot com slash soccer. And you can get an extra three months free expressvpn.com slash soccer for an extra three months for free. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's show and keeping us all secure. Today's episode is brought to you by NetSuite by Oracle. Slow is right if you're on vacation, but when it comes to taking control of your financials, your inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more, slow is not ideal. In fact, I would say it's the opposite of ideal, and that is why now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time. No matter how big your business grows, failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to be stuck behind. It doesn't go well. Uh, Unless you're a tortoise and a hare, unless those competitors are very arrogant. But if they're not, you don't want to be behind. You want to be ahead. 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control since switching to NetSuite. And right now, special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program only for those ready to switch today. Head to netsuite.com slash sports right now. Get special financing at netsuite.com slash sports. netsuite.com slash sports. Thank you very much to NetSuite for sponsoring today's episode. Now back to the show. Soccer 101, we are back. We are talking playoffs. Now, um, they are very common all around the world, as we've made clear, but there are some quirks. There's some interesting ones. Um... Graham, I'll come to you. They are used, as uh, as soccer fans will be very aware, in the international game in World Cup qualification. Yeah, and I think you're um, pointing me towards the, for me, the weirdest playoff in world football, and that is the intercontinental, intercontinental playoff in World Cup qualifying, where you have four teams, um, two from... Two from uh, it's one, sorry, one from Oceania, one from Asia, and two from CONCACAF. Is that right? Have I got that right? It's- and... It's one, I believe it's one CONCACAF, one CONME Bowl, yes, and, that's then, right, and yeah. then one Oceania and one Asia. That's right, Joe, it is. So it's, it's four teams that come together, that, and uh, from that, there's a spot for the World Cup, and it seems like an afterthought. I mean, it's great and wonderful, and I love it, but it definitely feels like a glitch, and it feels like FIFA forgot they had <laughs> some qualifying spots to hand out and just botched the solution. So, you know, for the 2018 World Cup, you had New Zealand playing Peru, for a place at the 2018 World Cup and that, that that just feels like unless it's a major tournament that's not something that should happen but I'm also very pleased that it exists well it must exist because playoffs are a virtuous thing Graham and we like the extra spice they provide right otherwise they just divvy it up elsewhere yeah I guess so I mean those those matches that's what I mean by when I say it's great you know it's it's a strange spectacle and it is a spectacle so I'd, I would much rather have that spectacle than just I guess give it to the you know the next team in uh, CONCACAF or Common Ball or whatever it is yeah absolutely um, well there are plenty of domestic uh, leagues that use them I've counted at least 17 in my research and there are quite a lot more I think as well um, there's a lot of places that use them as promotion from your second tier to your first tier and below as well England as we've mentioned there um, the championship playoff game which gets a lot of you know it's, it's shown on US TV it gets a lot of publicity it's the 
touted as the, the, the richest game in all of the world. Uh, the, the figure touted often around $100 million it's worth or upwards thereof uh, for the winning team who gets a place in the Premier League. There's promotion playoffs in Italy, in Netherlands, in Germany. And also, speaking of Germany and the Netherlands, relegation playoffs. Um, so uh, there's, there's some interesting ones out there. For example, uh, it, the, Nether- the, the relegation playoffs in the Netherlands, it's the 16th place team in the top division who plays six teams from the Erste division, the second tier. So there's a total of seven teams who are in this relegation playoff with just one of them coming from the Eredivisie at the top. So last season, NEC went up to the um, Eredivisie. They finished seventh in the league below. They were 11 points behind de Grafschap in third. So that's a little wild the way it happens there. And in Germany, we know they have a relegation playoff too. The team that finishes 16th in the Bundesliga and third in the Zweite Bundesliga, uh, they contest a relegation playoff and- over two legs. Um, this one, that was that ran for 10 years from 1981. It was brought back in 2008-09. It tends to be in Germany that the team that is already in the Bundesliga maintains its play. In those 13 playoffs since its reintroduction, 10 times has the Bundesliga team stayed up. But there are and, then, some- and then in Greece, and, and sorry to button right, but yeah. in Greece and, the, and the, the Eredivisie in Holland, they have a playoff as well to decide European qualification, which yes. is another thing that's slightly different. So in the Netherlands, the playoffs for that is for clubs placed eight, uh, fifth through eighth, mm-hmm. and the winner of that playoff receives uh, a place in the second qualification round of the Europa League. So that's, a, that's another way that playoffs can be used to decide something within a league structure. I'm just yes. going to say it. The Netherlands need to get it together. I think we're all <laughs> thinking it at this point. Uh, Joe, if you think that's wild, why, why didn't why not I tell you about what they do in Belgium? In the oh, Belgian go top on. division. They made some rather big changes about a decade ago in 2009-10. So they not only have a relegation playoff, they have two sets of other playoffs at the top. Places one through four play off the championship and for the various levels of Champions League qualification. And then five through eight play off for a Europa League spot. This has changed. They have changed it a little bit during COVID. But it's a, it's a pretty wild point system there. And not only that, it gets even more wild because at the top, when they go into that championship playoff for the team, one through four it's not just an even playoff they play a little round robin session but it's weighted because they go into it they divide the points they got in the league by two for all of them and then that's where they start so the team that finished first is nope, weighted heavier than the team that finished fourth <laughs> it's super complicated and it's so hard to explain but it's wild Belgium relegation playoffs did they, championship playoffs and Europa, uh, European League qualification it's wild Graham did they, did they look at MLS and think that's, that's too straightforward for us uh, we need to add some layers of complexity to that all right Uh. i've got another one for you um bulgaria of course we all know about the bulgarian top division where it is completely playoffs at the end of the season every team gets into a playoff of some kind after the regular season finishes there's a championship group for the top six teams who battle it out for the championship title uh the europa league uh europa conference league group through seven through ten uh seven through ten battling for the right to get into the europa conference league and then a relegation group in 11 through 14 so there's 14 teams every one of them in a playoff of some kind bulgaria you naughty boy oh goodness <laughs> me um joe have you found any quirks or interesting uh, playoffs from around the world? I do have some quirks. First of all, Ryan, fantastic work by you. My head hurts, but in a in a good way, and I think you I'm did sorry. a great job of explaining those, so I, I wanted to give you props there. I want to talk about Tasmania, everybody. Everybody's familiar with the Tasmanian top division, as of course. as we're all familiar with Bulgaria, right? Yeah, who isn't? Graham, Graham watches all their games every single weekend, right? <laughs> just one, just four of his you know 37 games that he's watching. There's eight teams in the Tasmanian top flight. Everyone plays everybody twice in a league format. It's all good. It makes sense. Everybody's got those 14 regular season games. Then the top six make it to the playoffs. Okay, that's, that's a bit of a high percentage for me. 75% is something that maybe MLS would like to get to, but just hasn't been bold enough to do so. They're at 75%, so six of eight teams making the postseason. That's pretty standard, though. Not very hard to wrap your head around. And then, guys, they add in the two regional division winners, to form an eight-team playoff. So all but two teams from the top flight make it into the postseason, and then they're joined by one team from the North Division and one team from the South Division to make a, a nice, rounded eight-team bracket. That's that's fine, and conceptually, it's not nearly as hard to understand as some of the ones that Ryan was tossing out. It's not as complicated. It makes sense. But it is possible, fellas, for a team that didn't play a single minute in the Tasmanian top flight to be the champion 
of the Tasmanian <laughs> top flight, which just does not make any sense to my small little minds. Uh, it is incredible content, though, and, and for that, Tasmania, I thank you. A real salt lake in the Tasmanian league. <laughs> They should be. They probably do quite well, to be honest, Ryan. <laughs> they would. It sounds like it's built for them, Joe. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, Taylor, anything else to add on, on quirky playoffs? Well, I wanted to ask Graham, the, th- the thing that you were describing with Belgium, Ryan, isn't that kind of what Scotland does? Don't they have a regular season and then at the end of the regular season they split the table and they do another sort of series of games where everybody plays, if, like, I think everybody plays, the, if you're in the top six, you play everybody once and that yeah. adds to your points total as well? I was I was hoping no one would ask me about this. <laughs> it's not a playoff, right? So okay. it's not a playoff. But yes, the league does split into two. And then so that if you're in the top six, it's almost like that as a league in itself. And, and um, you pl- your final five games are against the, the other five teams in that top half. And if you're in the bottom half, the, your final five games are against the other teams in the bottom half, which means that the team that finishes top of the bottom half often finishes with more points than the team that finishes bottom of the top half which is peculiar yeah. uh that's very huh. peculiar but we, we do also have a relegation promotion playoff with uh a team from the top flight joining like three teams from the the second tier as well so it is it is quite complicated but i i, I actually quite <laughs> like it once you've got your head around it it does actually work quite well i don't think we're on the level of uh belgium yet because by the sounds of it who is <laughs> i think yeah. these conversations are so important to me because we often hear about how like like absurd the structure of Major League Soccer is, or why do you do it this way, or what what a weird peculiar system you have. And then we get into the intricacies of different leagues around the world. And it feels like MLS is not alone in having strange setups and systems in place. Playoffs, I think, make a lot of sense, again, if that's kind of what you're culturally used to, and if you're more about like crowning the ultimate champion after this slog, and now you've got the top team playing the other top team, I think there is a like a competitiveness to that that people enjoy versus it feels like with a lot of sort of you play everybody home and away at the end, whoever has the post, most points wins feels more representative of the season itself. It's basically waiting the regular season a lot more than I think other leagues do. And I think there are strengths and weaknesses. There are merits to both and there are reasons to enjoy the other ones as well. Indeed. Well, why don't we turn the debate, Taylor, to the, the, the concept of playoffs in general? Are they a good idea or should it be done differently? Should we, should, you know, maybe we can talk about MLS and 51.9% of teams getting through. I'll, put, I'll set my stall out first. I'll say that I love playoffs for promotion and relegation between leagues. Um, I've, I've been to a couple of playoffs that AC Wimbledon have been in and it's glorious. It's very exciting. But I don't love them for deciding championships, whether that's yep. in lower tiers or the very top tier. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter shield guy, is what I would say. Um, so that's my position. Taylor, where do you stand? Uh, I think for Major League <laughs> Soccer, I got no problem with playoffs. I, I think I understand why people would like it to be just the regular season table, because that's more reflective of what the top leagues around the world tend to do. But then other leagues have the Apertura Clausura situation, and I don't know if we want to go that way either. And you could make it sort of you're playing your regional teams and then you're playing a national league. I think there are permutations throughout. So I think at the end of the day, I like playoffs because I think they add a a level of unpredictability. And I think for Major League Soccer, which still is trying to get its foothold in North America or certainly in this country when it comes to people watching the game, tuning in, going to games, I think playoffs help direct attention. I think it's kind of hard for Americans who are, as I said, grow up like rooted in the playoff system. That's what we kind of know for there to be meaningless games in the summer that don't like like that aren't meaningless in the sense that they'll matter at the end of the year, but also don't really factor into a playoff situation. I think people wouldn't embrace that as much. It's why I think they're willing to sit through August doubleheaders in baseball is because you have to win those games because playoff spots are at such a premium in baseball. It makes that regular season matter more. Mm -hmm. I do agree with Joe that when more than half of the league is getting in, it waters it down a little bit and, and removes some of the importance that I think you have to have for the playoffs to matter that way. Yeah, and that, that's it for, for, for me, from my perspective. It's just that the, the format that MLS uses right now, it just nullifies the regular season to such an extent. I will probably watch almost every MLS playoff match um, this year 
because they're you know they're they're interesting they're they're one-off matches it feels like there's a lot at stake and this comes after a year where i haven't really watched much for a number of different reasons but i haven't watched as much mls soccer as as i normally do and a large part of that is just because it doesn't feel like there's a great deal at stake so maybe the solution is i don't know much about baseball taylor but you're saying that places are a premium there to make Mm -hmm. the you know the world series limit the number of, of, of playoff places you still get th- those one-off matches to put on national TV to try and get the audiences but there's still a lot at stake in, during the season because obviously teams will feel that they can't lose games because they won't make the playoffs that that might be the solution I may be wrong they may have changed this because I am not as avid of, of a baseball viewer as I once was and even then not that avid but as, as it used to be you had American League National League uh, in the American League, let's say you have three different uh, divisions, and then I think the winner of each division makes the playoff, and you have the one wild card spot. Whoever has the next best uh, record, they get to go as well. So you have four teams from each league going eight teams in the playoffs total, whereas it feels like in a lot of other sports you have eight teams per conference or seven teams per conference, and it does sort of add in more teams. It, it basically makes the regular season more meaningful because you can go on a four-game losing streak but still be able to make that final spot or even have a worse record than that and still be able to get that final spot and then it's about what you can do from there so it does sort of incentivize the playoffs themselves as opposed to valuing the regular season as much as the playoffs but I guess if you're trying to crown an ultimate champion at the end of the playoffs you don't want them to be equally balanced the the other thing that I don't really like about the MLS playoff format as it is right now is it limits the matchups that you can have because of the the conference, the two different conferences it being split into the two conferences. And I understand why why it is split into two conferences and the geographical um, mm-hmm. logistical issues that MLS has. But it it just feels like you know I was th- I always think back to the height of the Messi Ronaldo rivalry. Every Champions League season for a while, it was are we getting a classical final? And while it never happened. You know that that was a that was a pretty strong narrative of that rivalry, and obviously we had the Madrid derby in in, in the, the final one year, and obviously the rivalries tend to be based around geography, and you you can never have a you know a a Timbers Sounders MLS Cup final, you can never have a an El Tráfico uh, MLS Cup final. I know you can have them in the conference finals, but you've still got a match after that, and so that that I I don't really like that. I, I think I like the prospect of. Every, once every so often you get a massive rivalry and in, in the most important championship game of the season and at the, and there's there's limitations on that happening on it in mls in the current format and i've already contradicted myself uh for people who've already written their tweets we know now uh major league soccer or major league baseball excuse me expanded in 2012 that's the last time i guess i paid attention in detail to major league baseball playoffs but they added additional spots so i think it's now 10 teams total who make the postseason so even baseball is expanding it a bit more they're going the opposite direction of what i think we're advocating for indeed all right some good points made there joe by the way you're on board with our general uh, gist there with uh, with playoffs and whether we like them yeah, they're fun, right? I, I just think it's important to remember what they are and what they're not, right? Playoffs are fun, somewhat random, dramatic, all that good stuff. It's it's a lot of why we like this sport. Playoffs are not the best way of deciding who the best team is in any given mm-hmm. league. They're just not. That's the regular season champion because it's a much bigger body of work. So as long as we're all on the same page and people out there are on the same page when they're watching playoffs, by all means, I think have a blast, have lots of playoffs everywhere all over the world, which is kind of already happening. Joseph Lowry, the voice of playoff reason. I love it. Uh, Why don't we finish this episode off, gents, by talking perhaps about some examples of great playoff moments from various competitions through the years. Joe, I'll come to you first, actually. Why don't we start with MLS um, playoffs? Uh, The one that really sticks in my mind, the one that I was sort of gripped from start to finish, was 2013, um, Sporting Kansas against Real Salt Lake. The one that was in Kansas City, where Jimmy Nielsen, who saved two penalties in the coldest conditions yeah. possible uh, and a really long dramatic shootout that one was super fun for me yeah there have been so many phenomenal mls playoff moments that skc rsl game from 2013 is a great one the uh the locker room fight between or not the locker tunnel fight excuse me between mm. toronto fc and the new york red bulls a few years back that's an all-time moment with some key national team figures involved as well coaches getting in on on some of the scrum just an elite moment go go look that up watch as much of that as you can uh 2018 is another one 
one that I want to mention. Portland versus Seattle. It's 4-4 four to four at the end of the second leg, which was played in Seattle. Portland had just scored two goals in Seattle to give them a 2-1 advantage in terms of away goals. A few of the Portland players, including Sebastian Polanco, who's on a tear for them right now in the postseason, thought that because they're up 2-1 on away goals and a, an overall tied score on aggregate, tied score on aggregate, that that would mean that the Timbers had won the game and advanced to the next round. But oh no, no, Portland's second goal came in extra time, which meant that it did not count towards That's away right. goals. But Portland didn't really know that, or at least not all of the Timbers players and coaches seemed to understand that. And so uh, Zarek Valentin had to explain the rule live on the field after the end of extra time to his teammates that were already celebrating to then realize that they still had to go through a penalty shootout and all of the mental challenges and hurdles that go through that. The Timbers won anyway, so it all turned out fine. But that is just for the pure chaos and, and the lack of understanding as to the rules. I don't think I'll ever forget watching that. Uh, that, that Portland Seattle game and seeing the confusion on specifically Sebastian Blanco's face. <laughs> Fantastic. Taylor, any moments that stand out for you? Yeah, uh, two there would be one would be the uh, 2015 playoffs between Portland. Portland getting a lot of uh, attention to this one. And Sporting KC, that would be the double post moment when they go to a shootout. Uh, it's uh, Abdul Salam steps up to, to, to take what could have been the decisive penalty. He hits it off one post. It still seems like it's going in because the keeper went the wrong way. And it doesn't. Instead, it hits off the other post and bounces back out. <laughs> Portland eventually go on to get the win, but that sort of, I think, is the most drama you could possibly get to in a penalty shootout. And then from a sort of playoff perspective and the importance of the playoffs, I would say the inaugural MLS Cup final with DC getting the the come from behind win in the rain. That it was sort of late on that they get the win, but then also because of the rain, it's got the sliding and it's got the celebrations with like a downpour and you can see the intensity and the atmosphere. And, and it feels very much like a championship game with championship drama. And so I think anytime you get that final game, having the all of like kind of the payoff for all of the season building towards that and everything that could happen there sometimes they're sort of damp squibs and it's not that much fun sometimes you get those big dramatic moments those kind of like cinematic moments that feel appropriate for a playoff final indeed graham any big playoff moments mls or otherwise for you i've actually got two others on my list here from outside the u.s and i wonder if you share any of them graham so I, I have to mention a recent one, David Marshall's save from Alexander Mitrovic in the Euro 2020 playoff against Serbia to send Scotland through to their first major tournament in 23 years. I have to mention that. So now that that's out of the way. <laughs> I do think um, it's a legal obligation at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's my most memorable uh, playoff moment, and um, another one, Ryan. I think you might have on your notes as well. as have you got the Troy Deeney one on your notes? Oh, it's the greatest of all time, oh. Graham. Go on. <laughs> yeah, so it might not have happened in the playoff final, but this is in my mind the greatest. Uh, for me, the English Championship are the are the purest form of soccer playoffs because they're so straight, uh, so simple and straightforward. You know, it's four teams, and you've got a semi final and a final. Uh, um, and I think this is the greatest championship playoff moment of all time, where Anthony Knockhart had a Leicester in the final minute, uh, had a penalty for Leicester in the final minute. Um, Scoreline's one all, and if he scores, he sends Leicester through to the final at Wembley. He misses, and then Watford come flying down the other end immediately. There's no break at all. They come flying down the other end of the pitch, and Troy Deeney scores, and it's Watford going to Wembley instead. And the commentary as well just adds to the the drama of the moment uh it was it was incredible i actually remember watching this on soccer saturday as it was happening um quite incredible um and another one i was going to mention was it's not a great playoff moment but certainly a memorable one is uh, Thierry Henry's handball for yeah. France against Public of Ireland which played a pretty big role in sending France to the 2010 world cup which uh that world cup went swimmingly for them so yeah. uh yeah, oh, 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 it was all good for them in the end. <laughs> Graham, I mentioned I had two playoff moments listed on my list and you just ticked them both off. <laughs> we dream the same dreams, we want the same things. Very good. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, I, listener, if you do anything with the rest of your day, please go onto YouTube and Google Watford Leicester Troy Deeney. That three, two to three minutes of footage is, I think, one of the best moments in soccer ever. It's just so dramatic. Troy Deeney volleying in the, um, the the winner there moments after the penalty was missed at the other end for 
what appears to be a dive as well. There's a bit of karma going yeah, on and there. It, um, and, it, and it's because the cross comes in from the right side as well, and you can see that he's going to finish it off. You know, there's kind of yeah. that, that, that split second of delay where he's waiting for the ball to come to him, and you know what's going to erupt. That, that just kind of adds yeah. to, the, to the whole moment. And it's, obviously it's at Vicarage Road and the, the, home, the home crowd. I, I mean, I could just retire as a fan after that if I'd experienced that moment. Unbelievable stuff. And yeah, the, the, the uh, t- 2010 World Cup qualifier you mentioned there with uh, France going through uh, on Thierry Henry's controversial handball. Very interesting. I was reading up a bit more about the aftermath of it. You mentioned France crashing and burning, of course, and having a mutiny in South Africa, which may be karma playing a part there. But Henry very much straight after the game admitting he handled it. And he was like, I'm not a cheat. I'll, I'll re- I think we should replay the game. But FIFA didn't want to have any of that. And uh, I did find out, Graham, that FIFA later paid the FIA, the Irish FA, uh, $5 million to help build their national team stadium. And the complaints went away. Fun. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember this I remember this moment kind of being key in the VAR discussion. Yeah. I think like, a lot yeah. of the VAR, the implementation of VAR went back to this moment. So thanks for that, Thierry Henry. <laughs> <laughs> he just keeps on giving. All right, I think we have just about covered the concept of playoffs. Taylor, is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye to dear listener? Uh, yeah, and and it's it's a, a typical preamble of, I hope this makes sense. We'll see if it does. But when people are first getting into European soccer here in the United States, I feel like there does tend to be some confusion about a lack of playoffs. The Ted Lasso joke about, like, ties and no playoffs. Why do you even do this? Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think the best way, if people ever have to, like, kind of deal with that question or are uncertain about how to process it, I think what makes sense to me is the idea that when you get to the Super Bowl, when you get to MLS Cup, when, when it is the final, of the playoffs there is this intensity there is this drama and spectacle that builds and if you're there for the game the fans coming into the stadium and because it's hosted by the dominant or the team with the best record you get that great atmosphere and it builds and it builds and there's this excitement behind it but with that the trade-off i would say and what i referenced earlier is like those midsummer games even if it's two of the biggest teams it's really exciting even if it's one versus one from east versus west or one versus two in one conference there's an element of like, yeah, but we'll see what happens in the playoffs. Like you don't have that same level of everything matters. And so I think with American sports, they build to that final event and all of the drama associated with it. Whereas when you don't have the playoffs, I feel like all of that drama gets spread out more over the course of the season. And so uh, Liverpool versus Man City in week three is going to have, or match day three is going to have a, a level of that anticipation of that enthusiasm because it could end up mattering. It could end up having a big impact on the title if Liverpool win the title by two points or City win the title by one point. That could mm. be all the difference. And so it does have more of a feeling of every game matters versus these games kind of matter, but they really matter once we get to the playoffs. And I think that balance is is really interesting because you can like one more than the other or you can like them both for what they are. But I think that's kind of how I understand the difference between the two. So it's a, a, a different distribution of entertainment and thrills, then Taylor, either yeah, through the so. season or um, in, in a in a in a cumulation cumulation. That's not a word. <laughs> uh, coming right at the end, Taylor. Yeah. I suppose is my point there. And you, you make a good point about the the the, um, the thrills coming earlier in the season. Like if you think of Liga, when um, Barcelona and Real Madrid were both good, seems like a long time ago now. It does. But um, you know there'll be a oh Barcelona lost to Osas- they drew with Osasuna. That's yeah. the title for Real Madrid now. And that's kind of exciting as well. And you don't necessarily get that with a, with a playoff champion. No, because it feels like, yeah, but at the end of the day, they could finish seventh and then go on that run that they need to go on. Whereas, like, yeah, if you had the, the title in La Liga, you got to get in the top six and then we play it from there. You could sort of feel comfortable predicting that either or both of Real Madrid and Barcelona are going to be in, the, in that final almost every season. Atleti probably in that conversation, too. They're a pretty good team when it comes to playoffs and knockouts and that sort of thing. Indeed. Well, gents, uh, that's the podcast. Thank you very much indeed. I think we should all go away and learn more about Belgium to make our heads hurt (laughs) a little bit more. Um, Taylor, thank you so much for this one. Uh, Thank you as well, my friend. Joe Lowry, a pleasure, sir. Right back at you. And Graham Rudman, you keep on trucking, bud. (laughs) I will, as always. Thanks, listener. Bye! Bye!